So this is now chapter two uh, of the textbook on statistical learning. So I pretty much covered most of these topics, but I'll just go over them very quickly. So here we have the sales variable. You know, let's say it's about, you know, this data is about marketing and sales is the outcome variable, the, you know, the Y variable of what we want to model or predict. And we have three predictors or three features, the amount of um, ad spending on TV, radio, and newspaper. So, so a data point on the scatter plot on the left shows that if we spend you know, a certain amount of dollar uh, in TV advertisement, the sales of, let's say, that month uh, will be a certain value. So from this historical data, we can see that there's you know, some association between TV ad and sales and some association between radio ad and sales. Um, and this association is kind of summarized with these, with these lines. Let me use a different color. So these lines here represent the regression lines that are fit to this data. And then for, the, uh, for this scatter plot on the right, you see that the data is pretty much all over the place. There's no you know, clear trend. But still, if you fit a line, it appears there. So I think this is an important consideration that you know, when, we, when we have the capability to just you know, fit a model, it doesn't really mean anything necessarily. Because you can see in the scatter plot on the right that you know, the association between x and y is really loose. But still, you know, if you ask the software to fit a line for you, it does that. But you know, it will be you know, kind of questionable how good of a job this line is doing in terms of summarizing the trend. So in terms of notation, we use the features or the predictors, we represent them using a vector. For example, here vector x has three arguments or three coordinates, x1, x2, and x3. So x1 is the amount of spending on, let's say, TV ad, x2 on, is, is for radio ad, and x3 is for newspaper ad. And then a model, a simple model for how we think the data has been generated is this. This is the data generation process. This is our assumption of the actual real relationship between uh, between advertisement and sales. This is just some you know, elusive concept that doesn't, we never have access to it. We just assume that there is such a relationship, that there is such optimal function f, which defines the fundamental relationship between ad spending and sales. And even for that function, there's some epsilon, which has impacted the values of y. So values of y come from the data generation process defined by f plus some irreducible error epsilon. So this function f um, is good for making predictions uh, if you are able to estimate it properly. So in the case where we're using variable y, um, let's, say, let's say the variable y is uh, income, and the features that we have are seniority and years of education and, and marital status, then um, using a regression function, we can, for example, see that the level of seniority has an impact on income. We can see that years of, we can see that years of education has an impact on income. And we can probably also verify that marital status doesn't have an impact on income. So this is you know, one um, aspect of a simple you know, linear regression function uh, that is not just about predictions, but about making inference, about you know, um, making inference between possible relationships between a variable x and a variable y. Meaning that, for example, someone with higher level of education is likely to have higher income, keeping everything else equal. Or someone with a higher level of seniority is likely to have higher income, again, keeping every, every other factor constant. We can also see that two people with you know, everything constant, and one of them being married, the other one being single, their level of income should not be different. So these are just the, you know, the kind of regularities or patterns that we see in the data, and we can confirm these patterns using a regression model. So here is the ideal regression function. You can see it with the red curve. So this is just a scatter plot of y and x. Here we only have one free feature x and one outcome y. And this red curve is the ideal regression function. So the ideal regression function is a function that gives us the expected value the expected value of uh, y at each point of x. For example, when x is equal to 4, we can find the conditional expectation of y by, by looking at the y values of these points here. You can see that there are many points for which x is 4. We take the average of those y values, and the average is the expected value. So expected value is just a fancier name for average. So we just average these values. The average is this point, And this is the ideal regression function. So this ideal regression function is ideal because it minimizes the reducible error. So here at the bottom of the slide, you see the error of a, um, of a regression model. So this is the same thing as MSE that I told you about earlier. It has two components, the reducible part and irreducible part. The reducible part is you know, what we can actually reduce by using a better model. And the irreducible part is what is just natural in the data generation process, and we cannot do anything about it. So this ideal regression function f um, is a function uh, that has that has a reducible, a, reducible function of, a reducible error of 0. Because here, the reducible error is just a difference between some estimated function f hat and f. So if we can somehow magically have access to f and replace f hat with f, this thing becomes 0. 
Therefore, the total error that we get from using function f is just the irreducible part, you know, which is the part that we know we cannot do anything about it. Yeah, function g is just you know, a representation of the possible regression functions that we can use. So here, it says that the function, the, reg the ideal regression function is the function that minimizes this term over all the possible values of g. So with the example I provided here, we had a, b, and c. Let's say each of these is a function. g is the uh, notation used for family of all of these, family of all the possible things that we can do. That just defines the kind of, uh, you know, the, the feasible region. So, Essentially, what it says is that this function is ideal because it reduces the reducible part of the error to zero. And there's nothing better than that that we can do. So how to estimate f? So here, you can see that you know, with historical data that is not as dense as the previous example, there could be cases where you actually look at value 4 and you draw a line, a vertical line here, and that line doesn't intersect with any of the points. So the idea was that we wanted to look at values in the scatter plot that have x, um, x value 4 and take the average of their y values. But what if there's no intersection? Well, in that case, we're going to make these you know, assumptions of local averaging a bit, a bit more flexible. So instead of saying that x has to be equal to 4, here we say x is in the neighborhood of 4, which means that instead of just drawing one line, we draw essentially a range to capture some of the data points for which the x value is around 4. So even if a data point has x equal to 3.9, that's acceptable for our local averaging. If there's another data point that has x equal to 4.1, that's also acceptable because it's good enough. So we, take the, so we take the average of the y value of this point, this point, this point, this point, this one, you see? All of these points that I just colored have some y values, we take their average. And the average will be this green point here. So that's the concept of um, nearest neighbor um, averaging. We look, instead of having a fixed value, we look at the neighborhood of that value. And we take the average of the outcome variable in that neighborhood. And that would be our prediction. Any questions? So, so this idea is, um, is good when the number of predictors is small. Like when the number of features or predictors is less than four, this idea works very well. But when number of features is more than four, uh, this idea of local averaging actually suffers from curse of dimensionality. So for those of you who had APS 1070 before, anyone wants to explain what curse of dimensionality is? No? How many of you had APS 1070? No one? Oh, OK. All right, curse of dimensionality. Well, we're going to see it also in this course, so you don't need to worry about it. So, so curse of dimensionality means that in, in a predictive model, when the number of dimensions increases, then the um, capability of the model in finding local neighborhoods decreases. And it decreases exponentially. So let me give you an example. So here, let's say, uh, you know, for, for, for finding some neighborhood and averaging it for the sake of making a prediction with a low variance, let's say that we need a neighborhood of 10% of the data set. Let's say 10% is needed. Now, what we're going to see is how 10% means different things in one dimension, in two dimensions, and in higher dimensions. So if we only have x1 as our predictor, which is here on the horizontal axis, and the outcome, value, outcome variable is y, then for finding a local neighborhood of x1 around a certain point, we need these, uh, this range that is shown by two vertical lines. So the two vertical lines gives you a neighborhood of x1 around the value 0. And that neighborhood captures 10% of the data set. So all the historical data that we have are the circles, 10% of them, fall within those two vertical lines. So this is a 10% neighborhood for one dimension. And you can see that the radius of this, of this neighborhood is essentially the, the width of, of that sort of rectangle. So in one dimension, we just need to move this much in order to capture 10% of the data. What about two dimensions? So in two dimensions, if we have two predictors, x1 and x2, um, we need a neighborhood like this circle here. So the circle at the center of 0 and 0 for x1 and x2 is kind of creating a 10% neighborhood you know, as a circle. And you know, the radius of the circle just increases so much that 10% of the data points fall within the circle, fall inside the circle. right? And when you look at the radius of the circle, the radius of the circle is larger than the width of that kind of rectangle. So this is case of dimensionality. You can see that the number of dimensions changes from 1 to 2, like doubles but the radius of the neighborhood increases exponentially because you can see that the radius of the circle is more than two times the, the width of that rectangle. So this is you know, still kind of um, expected, but when we go to higher dimensions, it, it actually becomes even less intuitive. So here, uh, let's say that we want to capture 
of, of the data set, that's this vertical line, and each of these colored lines represent dimension. So P1 means one dimension, P2 means two dimensions or two features, P3 means three features, and so on. So you can see that for a 10% neighborhood with one feature, we only need a radius of 10%. So as long as the data are kind of distributed homogeneously, a 10% neighborhood gives you 10% of the data. But then when we have two dimensions, we need something around a radius of 40% or 35%. And then in the case of five dimensions, assume that we have five dimensions, then we need a five-dimensional sphere that covers 90-something percent of the whole space to capture 10% of the data points. So for, so with three dimensions, you need a sphere that is maybe this much, which is you know, getting quite close to the volume of the, of the cube. When we go beyond the cube, which is kind of difficult to draw, the sphere needs to actually break out of the, of the cube, of the hypercube, in order to capture a 10% neighborhood. Because all the points are going to be in the corners. And this is called curse of dimensionality. So in higher dimensions, all the points will be positioned in the corners of that hyperdimensional space. And that's why if you, if you have just five predictors, just five columns, that's nothing in machine learning. Sometimes we have 200 columns of predictors. If you have only five, you need to create a sphere that breaks out of the, of the cube to capture 10% neighborhood. Therefore, this neighborhood is not going to be local anymore. And we lose that whole idea of, of relevance of these points. Because when the neighborhood is local, we can say, all right, we couldn't find the value with x equal to 4. So we use the value where x was 4.1. So there was some, you know, some relevance between these, those points. But when you kind of break out of the sphere, and instead of x equal to 4, you find a data point where x is 40, then the whole idea of averaging doesn't make sense. So in terms of prediction accuracy, also the model will not be relevant. And that's why uh, we need also parametric models. Um, OK, so let's, let's continue with our lecture. Um, we, we started a bit late today with the lock and, and, and access to the computer. Uh, so that's why we, we, we still have you know, quite a bit to cover. Um, all right, so a regression model is a parametric and structured model. Uh, so for example, for estimating f, we can use f sub l. As you can see in here, f sub l is, a, is an estimated function with these beta coefficients times different uh, features. So here, x1 is a feature, x2 is a feature, all the way to x sub p. Uh, this is because you know, the data that we have has these columns. So let's say the first column is x1. Uh, the second column is x2. Sorry, it's a bit too small. I cannot draw it. And each of these columns is one of these features, and we have p of them in total. And in, in a regression model, we're going to just multiply some coefficients to these values, and the total will be our regression function. So a regression function is almost never correct because it's so unusual for the actual data generation process that you know has some nuances, some patterns, some regularities, to all of a sudden being a line. And the data generation process is also noisy. So even if for some reason there's some proportion to the relationship between x and y, the noise must prevent the data points to exactly follow a line. That's why the textbook says a linear, fun a linear regression function is always incorrect. But you can see that, for example, on the top panel for, this, for kind of explaining the relationship between x and y, a simple line is doing a you know, relatively decent job. It kind of summarizes the trend uh, between you know, x and y. And maybe it's, it's doing a good job you know, in the middle here in this region. But at the end, you can see that actually the data points are showing that you know, when x is larger than 4 and half, y kind of increases with a, with a kind of a faster speed, right? Um, and also when x is around 2, again, y doesn't decrease as much as this line predicts. That's why a, a, um, a regression of degree 2 or a polynomial of degree 2 is doing a better job at capturing the patterns in the data, because this one you know, is kind of giving a swirl here that shows here x doesn't increase as much, and it's kind of explaining this part of the data as well. So this second model is more flexible, but this level of flexibility is needed for this data, as you can see. So here is um, data with two predictors or two features. So let's say income is the outcome variable y, and level of seniority and years of education are the uh, predictors or features. So this is the true data generation process. So this is just simulated data meaning that we have access to this blue curve. And you know, having the formula for this blue curve, we can generate new data points from it with some noise epsilon, which is the irreducible error. So the points that we create from this curve are the red circles that you see. And the differences between the red circles and the blue curve is the irreducible error. So as you can see, sometimes you know, these red circles are exactly on the, uh, are, you know, so close to the curve. But sometimes they are higher. Sometimes they are lower. That's just because of the irreducible error or the noise in the data generation process. So if we want to predict this data generation process or model these data, then we can use multivariate linear regression. And that's going to give us 
a surface like this, right? Just a plane. And this plane is, again, like doing relatively okay job in terms of summarizing the fact that income increases with increase in years of education. That's kind of this dimension. And it summarizes the fact that um, income increases with increase in level of seniority. So it's capturing this much of the regularities in the data that y is increasing with x1 and y is increasing with x2. It's doing a good job in this sense, but you may remember that there was kind of a change of slope you know, and some kind of more nuance to how y was changing. It was not just an increase with a constant rate, but it was an increase that was slow and then fast and then slow again. So in the sense of capturing that speed, it's not doing a good job. So this is underfit. This one um, comes from a more flexible model so a more complex regression model that we fit using a thin plate spline. And using a thin plate spline, you can see that we can get a, get a, a surface like this, which is now capturing more of the nuances in the data. Not only the fact that this is increasing, but the increase is, is first slow, and then fast, and then slow again. Again here, the increase is slow, then fast, then slow again, right? So this uh, prediction, or this model, is, is better at fitting the data. So this is a suitable level of fit. And if we use an even more complex model, we can get a surface like this, and this surface is overfit to the data. Why is it overfit? Because you can see it's kind of going out of its way to, to reach each and every single data point in the data set. So it's capturing the signal, which is the patterns in the, in the you know, data, as well as capturing the noise. So it's capturing all those red dots, but the red dots come from the data generation process and the irreducible error. So it's capturing both the signal and the noise, and that's the issue with this. As it is flexible, it also fits to the noise, and that's something that we want to avoid in machine learning. So there are some trade-offs in machine learning. One is the trade-off between prediction accuracy and interpretability. So linear models are interpretable, like this one. I can easily explain it to anyone without any background in machine learning. But maybe you know, a, a thin plate spline is more complicated and therefore less interpretable. But in terms of making good predictions, it, it does a better job, as we saw earlier. Another trade-off is you know, in terms of level of fit. So we have uh, overfit and underfit at the two extremes, and a suitable level of fit in between. And we have parsimony versus black box models. So models that are parsimonious are simple enough um, that, I mean, they are, they are only as flexible as, and complex as needed for what they want to predict. So I remember that a while ago in some research study, we used a neural network for uh, dealing with some missing values. So the response we got from the, from the reviewers of that paper was, you know, it was an overkill. For missing values, no one uses a neural network. People just check if they are missing and delete those records. Or they just check that they are missing and replace them with the average, right? But we use the neural network to make predictions for each and every single missing point. So in that case, we are maybe using a model that was too complex for the task. Um, so a parsimonious model means that a model that is only complex as much as needed and not more. And then sometimes we have black boxes, right? So we have models that are so complex that are difficult to um, explain, but, uh, but they do a good job for, for the prediction. So let's say if the prediction is only about you know, uh, you know, a simple task, maybe classification between tuna and salmon. If we have data on length and weight of fish, and we want to predict whether a certain fish is a tuna or a salmon, this shouldn't be a difficult task, because these two types of fish have different weights, right? And uh, if we use, let's say, uh, a boosted tree model for that, that would be an overkill. That would be you know, using a black box model for something that doesn't need that much complexity. So this pretty much summarizes you know, the trade-off between flexibility and interpretability. We have models like subset selection and lasso regression, which we're going to learn later in the course. These are models that are highly interpretable because they don't use that many features that you know, maybe they use three of the predictors or five of the predictors and kind of throw away all the other columns in the data. Therefore, they are highly interpretable because the, the line that we would get from them are going to only have x1, x2, x3, maybe four and five, that's it. So if I want to explain why the prediction is a certain value, I can say this prediction is this value because your age is 35 years old, your level of education is you know, this much, um, your, your district is here, and your credit score is this value. So only four predictors. At the other extreme, we have methods like tree-based, you know, advanced tree-based methods like bagging, boosting. We have support vector machines. Um, and these are the methods that are not as interpretable, but they are more flexible. So they are capable of capturing more of the patterns in the data. So, that's why we need you know, a method for assessing the level of accuracy of a model. So if we are, um, yeah, if, and, and for assessing the level of accuracy, we use the concept of MSE. So I pretty much you know, covered this part uh, at the beginning of today's lecture. So MSE, as you can see, is just the average between predictions and the true values. And we can have MSE on the test data set and MSE on the training data set. MSE on the training data set is, is a biased sort of evaluation because we're evaluating the model on the data that it has seen before, but MSE on test is, is a better, more relevant evaluation. So in terms of bias variance trade-off, uh, this plot on the left shows you know, the same idea that we discussed at the beginning of today's lecture. If the data generation process is the black curve, so the black curve is the truth, it's the data generation process. Now in terms of fit, fitting a model to it, um, the yellow model is too simple, so it's underfit. The, there's some blue model, 
that's a good fit because it's so close to the red curve. So let me just zoom in so that you see better. So the blue model, sorry, uh, yeah, the blue model is very close to the black one, as you can see. And there's, there's also a green model, which is very, very, I mean, has such a high variance. It's kind of going out of its way to fit each and every one of, I mean, to fit these data points as closely as possible, right? So this green one is going to be overfit. And we see that in, in the plot of MSE. So here we have the U shape of MSE on the test data. You can see that for the yellow model, for the regression line, we are underfit here. We are overfit here, and the blue, the, and the blue uh, model is, I mean, has a suitable level of fit. So this is another example. Um, so I told you that typically MSE looks like a U, but it doesn't have to be like that. So here is a case where the MSE is not exactly a U. So you can see that when we increase the level of flexibility, uh, everything just becomes worse, just MSE increases. In situations like this, the suitable choice is a model that is very simple so that, you know, so that you know, this region is kind of where we want to be. For a task like this, when we see that when we increase the flexibility of the model, MSE increases, well, we don't do that. We stop at the, at the like, low complexity region. We just use a simple linear regression. So this is the case where linear regression, which is the yellow model, is very close to the very best model that we can have. So the best model is the blue one, um, and linear regression is not that far from it. So you can see that the blue one has the flexibility to kind of you know, have a form other than just a line, but it's not that different from a line. So in these cases, we actually prefer linear regression. Um, and the, the horizontal line here is the irreducible error. So I told you that we want to get as close to irreducible error as possible. So if we, you know, typically we don't have information about the irreducible error. But in this case, you can see that linear regression, the error from linear regression is so close to the irreducible error. Therefore, it's good enough. We don't need something more complicated. Here is the other extreme. This is a case where linear regression is so incapable of capturing the patterns in the data. You can see that the data, you know, has kind of a decline at the beginning, then a kind of a slow increase, then another sharp decline. So the pattern is very nonlinear. Therefore, if we use a line or a linear model, we are not capable of capturing the patterns. So you can see that we are very underfit. Underfit. In this case, the suitable model is somewhere here. And you can see that when we increase the level of flexibility, MSE mostly gets better and better. And even if we use a highly flexible, highly complex model, nothing really goes wrong. So this is the case where we should use something like a neural network. So you may see that you know, in many cases, in many applications, people use deep learning. Well, actually, that's not the right thing to do. Because for many situations, you should not use such a flexible model. Because if you do that, the model is going to also fit to the noise. And this is the case that actually deep learning models are going to perform very well. Because noise is low. As noise is low, this horizontal line is low. Therefore, regardless of how much we increase the complexity, there wouldn't be any undesirable consequences. And the variance doesn't increase that much. Therefore, the MSE doesn't increase that much. So, so I think I already covered the concept of bias variance trade-off. And this is the summary of, of the previous plots. Um, so pretty much we mentioned all these concepts in the context of regression, where the outcome variable is, um, is a continuous variable. But we can have the same concepts in classification problems, where the outcome variable is, uh, is qualitative. For example, in uh, you know, predicting whether a, a fish is tuna or salmon. You know, the outcomes, which is tuna or salmon, are discrete. There's nothing in between. It's either this one or that one. So that's a classification problem. Uh, for example, predicting whether an email is a good email or ham, or it's an unwanted email or spam, right? So in spam detection, that's a classic classification problem. So for classification problems, we have the same concepts of you know, bias variance trade-off and so on. So, um, so here, we have a classification problem where y takes either 0 or 1. That's why our scatter plot looks really strange. For x values, we have you know, a range of values for x, but for y, we, we, we only have 0 and 1. Right? So reading the scatter plot is a bit difficult. Uh, so don't worry about it if it, if, if it you know, doesn't look like the scatter plot that you would normally expect. Because scatter plot, we use it for continuous variables. Here, y is, is discrete. So for classification, the idea is that instead of local averaging for, for getting the value of y, we're going to have local averaging by you know, maybe looking at this neighborhood, at the neighborhood of 5, and seeing for the data set, that we, for the data points that we have, where x is around 5, how many of them have a value of one for y, and how many of them have a value of zero for y, right? So let's say about, you know, about credit card applications, you know, uh, we want to know whether you know, someone with a credit score of 500 should get accepted or not. Well, we look at, at the history of the data. We see there, there are 100 people in our historical records who have credit score around 500, and 70% of them got accepted, 30% of them didn't get accepted. What would be our prediction for that person who has 500? The prediction would be acceptance, because it's just more likely. So this is called base optimal classifier. So when we classify based on the class with the higher likelihood, this is called base optimal classifier. That's pretty much the best thing we can do when we have these uh, probabilities. So this is the same case, uh, but now you know, the data is more sparse. That's why we need to kind of look at some neighborhood of, of, 
a certain value, and in that neighborhood, we see that there are this much, this much blue points and this much yellow points, so we classify as blue. So that's, that's the idea of, um, of, a <clears throat> of an optimal base classifier. So in classification, in self-measuring MSE, we measure the misclassification error. So you know, if we uh, you know, classify that applicant as accepted for credit card, uh, then if you have the ground truth, we can see that you know, whether that person actually gets accepted at a bank or not, right? And based on that comparison, we can see whether our prediction was correct or not. And for the you know, fraction of times that we misclassify something, that's, that gives us the misclassification error. So this is the value. So misclassification, of, misclassification error of a classifier can be 10%. This means that the classifier is accurate 90%. So that's just the, you know, the complement of, of accuracy. So um, we only have three, four slides left. Um, so with k-nearest neighbor classifier, we can assume that the data generation process looks like this uh, plot. So here, uh, we have two predictors, x1 and x2, and the colors, is, uh, the colors represent the outcome variable. So the outcome value variable is either blue or yellow, right? And the um, dashed line represents the uh, base decision boundary. So the base decision boundary is you know, the same concept as the data generation process. So you may remember that we had a line right here, which was kind of swirly, right? So also here, the, the decision boundary is swirly. So the best classifier that we can use is a classifier that fits this line perfectly and creates the same boundary. Uh, so in that sense, if we use KNN uh, or K-nearest neighbor classifier with a value of 10 for K, you can see that we get this black curve, which is quite close to the purple curve. Um, and therefore, this is a relatively good fit for this task. If we use value of 1 for K, uh, then we get an overfit model. So this is overfit because you can see that the curve that we get is kind of too detailed for capturing the, the patterns in the orange curve. And if we use 100 for K, we get under, sorry, underfit. And this is overfit. So also in KNN, which we're going to learn more about this classifier next week, also in here we have the same concept of bias variance trade-off and you know, underfit, overfit. So the left is overfit, the one on the right is underfit, and this one is a good fit. Just because you know, the best thing we can do is the orange curve, this one gets so close to the orange one, and these ones are not really doing a good job in matching the orange curve. So also if you look at the MSE, the, the equivalent of MSE, we have a, something like this, another U-shaped curve. So, this is you know, high, high flexibility region, and this is low flexibility region here. So you can see that when we increase the level of flexibility, this misclassification error rate first kind of declines, and this is the minimum, and then it increases. Therefore, the suitable level of flexibility is this much. And this gives us the value of our hyperparameter, k, for the KNN classifier. We're going to learn more about this next week. Uh, but yeah, pretty much that's the same concept. We have another sort of U-shaped curve, except that now it's kind of discrete, and the minimum of that curve is where we want to be. So thanks a lot for your attention, and see you next week.